Well, hey, we're starting a brand new series today, and we could not be more excited about it. It's called Are You Ready? And uh, man, we're just praying this is going to be a faith-filled series that will stir your faith for what's possible. You know what I've realized is too many people look into the future and expect bad things. And if I've learned anything over this last year, it's that we cannot afford to look into the future and expect bad things. How many know that because we know Jesus, we can look into the future and hope for a good future? Come on, filled with the blessing of God, with the peace of God. No matter what the circumstances are, we can look to the future with hope and with a positive expectation that God is going to be good even if everything else is not. Amen? And so I'm just excited about it. And I want to uh, talk to you about a very important subject today. If I had to give today's message a title, I would call it, Are You Ready for Revival? Are you ready for revival? So grab your Bibles with me and uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 11. The book of Acts chapter 11. Online family, you can turn with me or if you're driving on your treadmill or something, please don't try to turn there. We'll just throw it on the screens for you. Early service. I'm so impressed with you guys. <laughs> Thanks for coming early. There will be a special place in heaven for each of you. All right. It's good to see you guys early. Back to two services across our locations. And we know it's going to be a good day across the CFC movement. In case you do not know, um, we are a multi-campus movement. We have seven locations. Six of them are physical locations and our online family. Uh, we have a Spanish campus. We have a Slavic or Russian campus. And uh, we just love seeing what God is doing, not only in Idaho, but even in Northern California. Aren't you glad to be a part of a church that's touching the world? Isn't that great? All right, five of you are. Fantastic. That's awesome. All right. Well, I'm glad enough for all of you, okay? Acts chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 19. When you find it, shout yes. All right. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19. We're going to read a handful of verses together. And uh, then we're going to pray and we're going to dive into God's Word together. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19. The Bible says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, and Syria. They preached the Word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus and the power of the Lord. Everybody say the power of the Lord. The power of the Lord was with them and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned. Everybody say believed and turned to the Lord. And when the church at Jerusalem had heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, your Bible could say several things. It could say when he saw the grace of God. It could say when he saw the hand of God. The New Living Translation says when he saw the evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy. And he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. And Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. It was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Isn't that good? All right, pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. We pray you'd speak to us today through it. Stir our hearts, Lord. We pray for nothing less than just a touchdown of the Holy Spirit on our lives as we dive into your word. Lord, get my vocal cords through two services again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I'm excited about this new series. I really am. By the way, you should be excited about our ministry school. Come on, firing back up again in September. 
And uh, we're so excited about that. If you have ever thought about going into ministry, or even if you're just maybe in a gap year, maybe you're a young person, you're in a gap year, and you want to spend some time finding out what your calling is, serving the local church, growing in your walk with God, this would be a great thing for you to jump into. We have an intern program you can take or just a ministry track you can take. Uh, but it's going to give you a deeper walk with God. It's going to hone your skills in ministry. And I promise you, you will grow as a Christian. So you can register for that online right now. But I'm, a, I'm pumped about this series because it's interesting if you study out the New Testament church. I think a lot of people feel like circumstances have to be ideal for God to do something significant. Here's what bothers me and also encourages me at the same time about the Bible. It seems like the worse things get, the better the church does. And we see this revival that happened, really one of the first great revivals that broke out after the birth of the early church. And it broke out in a city called Antioch. It was directly following persecution in the local church. The believers were scattered, the Bible says. They were scattered everywhere. And as they were scattered and on fire for God, they just started to create fire everywhere they went. (laughs) And they boldly preached the Word of God and turned people to faith in Christ. But it was in a post-persecution setting that the church began to spread. And I've realized that adverse times have always led to a move of God. If you look at a nation under persecution... It is always led to a move of God. I've heard it said that Christians are like golf balls. The harder you hit us, the farther we go. Come on, somebody. And so no matter what happened to the church, it just seemed like if they were persecuted, it led to the church growing. If they were scattered, it led to the church growing. If they were under pressure, it led to their faith growing. When darkness came against them, the power of God moved on them even greater so that the church always moved forward no matter what is happening in the world around them. Now, Antioch was the center of commerce and industry. It was a powerhouse of culture and power. It was about 300 miles from Jerusalem, but only about 20 miles from the Mediterranean, which qualified this as a port city. It was an important port city. Matter of fact, although it was also known to be great and prosperous and a center for trade, it was also known to be very wicked. The cult Artemis and Apollo worshipped at the temple, the temple of Daphne, and their ritual worship um, isn't even appropriate to talk about in front of children. It was very ungodly, very carnal, very wicked. But the temple Daphne was actually known as one of the wonders, one of the wonders of the ancient world. There was an amphitheater there that could seat over 24 thousand people. It was a large and prosperous area. And I want to give you just a couple thoughts about revival because it was in this setting that the church broke out and began to grow rapidly. Not in a place where there were a bunch of people that already loved God. Not in a place where Um, People necessarily were hungry for the things of God in a traditional sense. Not even in a place where there was a foundation. Like, well, you you know, at least they knew God or worshipped in some way and we could just hone that in. No, no, no. These were people that were living in a wicked way. Totally lost. Bound in darkness. A slave to prosperity and success and money and commerce and not even thinking about God. Even while it comes out of my mouth, it sounds awfully familiar. To a world that we live in today. And it was in this place that God began to do a supernatural work. And I think when you hear the word revival, we immediately go back to our grandparents' church in 1950, where there are a bunch of people, right, doing weird stuff in a small church building out in the country somewhere. 
But I want us to think about revival a little bit different because not only are we a church that has been in perpetual revival, I believe that our church is heading into a new season of revival. I believe America is headed into a new season of revival. I believe God is preparing his people to move in an unprecedented way in the days in front of us because God has to. The days we're living in are exceedingly dark. The only answer to our nation, the only answer to the problems we face, the only answer to the darkness in our world today. It's not government. It's not politics. It is a mighty move of God that would shake the nations. That's the only thing that's going to save us, friends. It's not going to be the next person we elect. It's going to be the God of heaven shaking everything from the governments down to the welfare office. Come on, somebody. It's everything in between. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken in the day we're living in. But it's important that we think about revival in the right way. Because some of us have an idea of revival that you would not want to experience. And some of you have been holding on to a past experience of revival so hard that if you were to see a current one, you wouldn't recognize it if it hit. And so I want us to look at what this revival looked like, and I pray that God would speak to us in a powerful way. Number one, I want you to write this down. If you're online, just jot it in your mind. Come on, somebody. Number one, revival, it turns our hearts. This is first and foremost a mark of revival, is that it turns hearts. The Bible says that the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. First of all, I want to point out, it says the power of the Lord was with them. Not the power of a pastor, not the power of an organization. The power of the Lord was with them. Revival comes not by the cleverness of men, not by the organization of a group. Revival comes from the power of heaven moving in the earth. It starts by God's power. And, and the Bible says when people, when God showed up, people began to believe and turn. See, when God shows up, people began to believe. I've seen this all over the nation. I've had the opportunity to be a part of great moves of God, go experience great things God's doing. I've even had the opportunity to preach at some of the greatest churches in America and see God move and do really, really great things. And what I've seen is anywhere God shows up in power, anywhere His Holy Spirit is present, people believe. People surrender their life to Jesus. People pipe up, wake up, and they believe. They sense His presence. Where there is revival, people hear from heaven. Where the Spirit of God moves, people walk out of a church service and they say things like this, that message was just for me. I'll have people walk up after the services sometimes and they'll say, did you preach that for me? Because you knew about, and I'm like, I wasn't even thinking about you when I wrote that. Some people, I'm like, I don't even know who you are, you know. (laughs) I'm not that good. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you in a private, personal, powerful way. God's speaking to you. When God shows up, it's personal. I found that people believe anywhere the word is preached, anywhere God is, anywhere that God shows up, people trust him and believe. But where there is revival, we see another characteristic. People not only believe, they believe and they turn. Anywhere the Spirit of God shows up, people believe. But when there is a genuine move of the Holy Spirit in a church, in a city, in a nation, people not just believe, but they believe and turn. You might say, well, isn't that the same thing? No. I know a lot of people that believe in God, but have never turned to follow Him. Matter of fact, James gets in our face aggressively. James is offensive to me sometimes. Come on, somebody. You ever read the Bible and you're like, ow! You know? Listen to James. He says, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the devils believe this. And they tremble in fear. <laughs> I'm like, ow, James, that's harsh, man. You know, like, 
Can you be a little nicer? No, no. James is pointedly getting something across to each one of us. He's saying it's not enough to just believe that there is one God. The mark of revival is that people not only believe, but they turn from their ways and begin to go in a new direction. They begin to live for God in a way they haven't been living for God before. He said even the devil believes, but he hasn't turned. And because he didn't turn, he trembles in fear before God. See, as believers, we are called not to emulate the devil by believing and trembling because we know we're not following him. We're called to believe in Jesus, to put our trust in Jesus, and to turn and follow him as sons and daughters of God, saved by the blood of Jesus, filled with the Spirit of God. This is revival that your life would change. One of the great marks of revival is that it turns people from one way to another. What I love is Saul of Tarsus, one of the great Pharisees of his day. We know him as the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. This dude was literally on his way to go kill Christians, imprison them, bring them chained, men, women, and children in cuffs if they made it alive, back to stand trial for what he believed was heresy. And he met Jesus in a powerful way on the road. He got up blind. God sent someone to pray for him. Scales fall from his eyes. He sees again. He devotes his life to Jesus, spends 10 to 12 years recalibrating his theology and gives the rest of his life to building the church of Jesus Christ and dies in a Roman prison in the end. How do you go from that to that? Only the power of God. That's how. The power of God will transform lives. You can come in addicted, broken, confused, and the power of God will spin you around the other direction. You can be free of sound mind and walk out of here different than you came in. Only the power of God can do that. Not philosophy, not emotionalism, but God's power working in and through us. It turns hearts. Where there is revival, there's always people turning away from the things of this world and turning to God. It's interesting to me that it's in this place, in Antioch, that they're called Christians. And I, now I had known that for a long time, but I had this thought. Perhaps the reason they were first called Christians in Antioch is because For the very first time, the world began to recognize them as people who looked like Jesus. Because they didn't just believe. They believed and they turned. They believed and they lived different. And the way they lived reminded them of the way somebody else lived. The way they talked reminded them of the way somebody else talked. The way they operated and moved in the Holy Spirit, perhaps it reminded them of Jesus And they started calling them Christians. It is when we believe in turn. We can't settle for less than this, friends. More than ever, the world needs to see Jesus when they look at His church. They need to look at His church and not not see something that looks the opposite of Jesus. They need to look at His church and see something that represents Him. We are the body of Christ. I heard an old preacher say one time, there must be an unction in the pulpit and action in the pew. (laughs) We can't have dead preachers. We can't have dead pulpits. We can't have people preaching dry religion. The world is perishing in darkness and there's death in the pew. No, we need, we need life out here and we need life up here so that when we get out there, there's a move of God. It's important that people encounter Jesus when they encounter the church. That they see Jesus when they look at the church. See, here's what revival does. You ready? And you can write this down. Here's what revival does. First of all, it wakes you up to the things of God. It wakes you up to the things of God. I love Ephesians 5.14. It says, Awake, O sleeper. Rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. Awake, O... See, um, George Whitfield said... The Christian world is in a deep sleep. Nothing but a loud voice can waken them out of it. You know when that was said? 1739. You ever woken up from a nap and you didn't even know what day it was? 
Come on, be honest. Some of you are going to go home and take that kind of nap. Listen, I need that kind of nap sometimes. Where you don't just fall asleep and wake up, you die and resurrect. You know what I mean? Um, a few weeks ago, we took our family to Orlando for vacation. And we had one of those like, you know, 6.30 flights or whatever. So we were up at 4 a.m. And I have a five-year-old. And um, he, he usually gets up earlier than the rest of us anyway. But I'm waking this guy up at 4 and he was pumped to go to Universal Studios, like pumped, you know, counting down the days and the hours before we would go. But you wake that guy up at four, it was amazing. He wakes up and he's just like sleep face, you know what I mean? And I was like, dude, it's time to go to Orlando. It's Universal time. He looks me right in the face and he goes, I'm too tired, rolls over and <laughs> covers him up with the blankets, you know, but we've all got our thing. We've all got our thing. You know, maybe you don't like to get up early. My wife and I, we have a saying, she needs a tight 10 and I need a straight eight. Come on, somebody. So we're a little different in that way. I can function on seven to eight just fine. She needs a tight 10. Okay. So she needs her beauty sleep. Um, but the reality is, is a lot of Christians today, I believe are living their life like they've got four hours of sleep. They're living their lives in a daze. You know, we got hit with all the smoke burning in California and Oregon. And it's funny, I feel like almost every year now that our valley becomes like the ashtray of the Northwest. You know, it's like all the smoke just settles right down here in the valley. And I was driving down toward my house. I live on the outskirts of Nampa. And I was driving down the hill, going out to my place. And you just couldn't see anything. It was just smoke. I couldn't see the Owyhees. I couldn't see anything. And I thought, I wonder how many believers live their life this way. They're awake, but they are not awake enough to see. They're awake, but they're not awake enough to really know what's going on in the world around them. See, people are living spiritually like they're running on four hours right now. And, and I just thought, man, I think this is our world right now. Because our world is going so dark, and I feel like nobody realizes it. I was flipping through the channels the other day, and it said like, hot new show or trending right now. And it was a show just outright. It was just called Lucifer. Like what, what kind of world are we like? That's a, that's a hit TV show. Just the devil. And then I flipped through another one and it was just called like the good place. And it's just people that are going to heaven or hell. And we're, we're digging into these spiritual realities, but we don't even realize that we're consumed with things that are not just television, they're real stuff. And we're consuming it and consuming it. And we don't even realize that, that we're just taking in this darkness like it's normal. The television's dark today. There's nothing like having some kids that watch whatever you watch that really helps you to see what you're really watching. You're like, oh, wow. You know? But I wonder how many things we've just become desensitized to. I was, um, I'm kind of a shoe guy. And so I, I really like, I have all kinds of different shoes. And I know some of you guys give me a hard time about my shoes, but I love my shoes. And I, 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 I have some shoes from Converse that, that I really like. And I follow their channel on Instagram. And I came across a new line of shoe that Converse released. And it's called Dark Shadow. And it's literally a pentagram made out of humans in demonic white with metal teeth. And they flipped these people upside down and contorted their bodies to become a pentagram. And it's just the new line that they're advertising. It's just called Dark Shadow Line. And I, and I thought, first of all, that's wicked. Second of all, how many people see this kind of stuff and we're just like, oh yeah, that's normal. That's just the day we live in. I, I just, I need us to understand. So I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not just trying to make us all feel bad today. I'm trying to help us understand that we are living in a dark world right now. And the devil is not being quiet with his agenda and the devil is not being quiet with his message. 
And yet I feel like by and large, the church, we're just like, well, we're just going to keep our beliefs to ourselves, And we're just going to, you know, I believe, but I'm not going to share that. I don't want to impose my beliefs on everybody. While the devil's out here ramming his agenda down the throat of this generation, the believers of the earth are being silent. And I'm just telling you, revival, when it really happens in your life, will move your heart until that kind of stuff grieves you to the point where you you can't help but speak out about God and about Jesus and about what he's done for you. And you won't let the devil be louder about his message than you are about your salvation. Come on, if you believe it, shout yes. The, the r- real revival will turn your heart. It'll transform your life. It'll cause you to not be able to just sit back and let the devil be louder to your friends than you are about the message of Jesus. You know, we were calling good things bad and bad things good. We need to wake up in the church today. We need to wake up, America. There are dark agendas being leveraged upon us and our children. Even shoe companies are pushing the devil's agenda. We can't afford to be quiet about the one who saved us, the one who laid his life down for us. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given the power of God to do the business of God in the earth. He didn't do all that so we could just sit back and let the devil run. We're called to see the church built. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It'll turn hearts. It'll, it'll turn us to the things of God. More than turn you emotional, real revival will turn you to the Bible. It'll turn you to faithfulness. It'll turn you to prayer. It'll turn you to sharing our faith. It'll turn you to the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jerusalem was all about religion in this day. Rome was all about power. Alexandria was all about intellect. Athens was all about philosophy. But Antioch was all about business and immorality. And I feel like in many ways, America struggles with some of the same things that Antioch did. Our prosperity and immorality has grown to a huge level. America's ready to, for a revival. And it will, it, I think America will experience it when the church does. I want you to look at this passage because I want you to see how this broke out. In verse 20, the Bible says, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible says. One of the greatest revivals in the Bible started with a handful of people that we don't know. It just says some of the believers. Some of those guys went on down there started telling people about Jesus. It wasn't a well-known pastor went and planted a church. Christian Faith Center didn't start a campus in Antioch. It wasn't any of those things. It was just a bunch of believers scattered by persecution, started sharing their faith, and the power of God was with them. It's amazing what can happen when we don't care who gets the credit. It's amazing what can happen when we when we take the trappings of religion off the Christian faith and realize that the Christian faith historically has been spread, has been influenced the most, not by big name pastors, not by some kind of marketing campaign or ploy, but by believers that just allowed the power of God to turn their heart to heaven and to God's agenda. By believers who allowed the Holy Spirit to stir them up in such a way that they could no longer be silent about their faith, that they could no longer be silent about what Jesus did for them. And they allowed the Spirit of God to move through them to the world around them, and the gospel went forward, and the church grew, and miracles happened. The power, the hand, the favor of God was on them to do great things. You know, fire leads to more fire. Passion leads to more passion. Change leads to more change. What I've realized is that revival, it's not just a type of service that churches do. It's not just a way we market something so that people think, oh, well, the worship's probably going to be extra long that week. No, revival is the power of God present to turn hearts. 
And it starts in here. It starts by letting God turn your heart. It starts by surrendering to say, Holy Spirit, turn my heart. Do something fresh in my life. It starts with me. See, in the Old Testament, God moved on people. He came on prophets to do something. Then He lifted back off. He came on a king to accomplish His purpose. Then lifted back off. But in the New Testament, the Spirit of God has been poured out in the hearts of believers. Jesus said this. Jesus said, if you believe in Me, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. In other words, the power of the Holy Spirit flows out of your life to the world around you everywhere you go. We don't have to wait for some spiritual, emotional moment for the Holy Ghost to come upon us. You've got the Spirit of God living in you. He's trying to get out of you to your family, to your workplace, in your school. Revival starts with you. Look at your neighbor. Say, I am revival. Come on, say it with faith. I am revival. God's Spirit lives in you. God's trying to get out of your life. You are the temple of God. Revival starts with us. Now write this down. It's my second thought. Revival turns the church toward grace. It turns the church toward grace. The church is revived when the hand of grace is visible. This is what I've learned. This is what I've seen. This is what we see in the Scripture. The Bible says that Barnabas was a representative from Jerusalem, which is where the the, the main overseers of the church, the apostles, made their headquarters, so to speak. And when they heard that this church had been born, that God was moving in Antioch, they sent Barnabas down there to check it out. They said, hey, Barney, you need to go find out what's going on down there. We hear people are getting saved, like stuff's moving and shaking. And this is what Barnabas said. Barnabas went down there, and this is what he said, I saw the hand of God on these people. I saw the hand of grace. New Living says, I saw the evidence of God's blessing on the church. It's pretty vague about what he said. There's no specific details. He just said, no, no, I saw the hand of God on them. I saw grace on them. I saw evidence of God. What was he saying? He saw God working. He saw lives changing. I think he showed up and saw people that were worshiping in pagan temples one week, now worshiping the living God this week. He saw people that were prostituting themselves one week, now worshiping Jesus. This He saw people that were living for the devil, now living for God. People that were living one way, now living another. He saw this collective group of people that had no church background, no history with God, radically turning to worship Jesus together. There was a move of God happening and there was evidence of it. There was grace on display. Lives changed. Hearts on fire for Jesus. Salvation coming to families. Guys, this revives the church. Without grace visible, every church will become stale and die. One of the saddest things to me is when a church no longer sees people saved, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and filled with the Holy Spirit and released to do what God's called them to do. It's, it, it, it just, it's a death nail in the coffin because it becomes religion and preference after that. It is grace that energizes the church. It should not be preference. It should not be style. It should not be size that is our focus. It should be the grace of God moving in the hearts of people. Who's getting saved? Who's getting touched by God? Who's getting added to the church? Where is the hand of God on display? Where are people that were drug addicts? Now they're free. Were caught in this addiction? Now they're not. Were lost in darkness? Now they're walking in light. Where are those people? That is the hand of God on display in a church. Because con- conversely, nothing kills the church faster than when grace is no longer... Vi- See, religion will pretend everything is perfect and we have it all figured out. And, and, and we become passive and we, when, there's no, when there's no passion in a church to see people get saved. It doesn't matter if we reach the world as long as we're comfortable. I mean, as long as the music is the way I like, I don't care. I don't care what else happens as long as they don't take my class away. I don't care what happens as long as my service doesn't change. I'm so glad we're not a church like that. 
I'm so glad we're a church that's like, whatever it takes to reach the lost. I might not even like it all the time, but as long as people are getting saved, as long as lives are being changed, as long as the hand of grace is on the church, I'm all in. That's what I, you know, there's going to be a day where I don't like the music. There's going to be a day where I think these young leaders coming up are losing their minds. It's already happening a little bit. But here's what I've purposed in my heart. If the hand of God is on it, who am I to critique it? If God is moving through it, I want to put fuel on that fire. I want to put, I want to put resource in that ministry. I want to get behind it with my influence, get behind it with my gifting, because I never want to be the person that stands in between the move of God and people. I have found that the greatest obstacle sometimes to what God does next are the people God used to do what he did last. Well, that's not how God did it when I was your age. Well, God's doing a new thing. I want to put fuel on the fire. I want to put, I want to get behind it. See, as a church, I feel like we have to maintain that revival or bust mentality. It's, it's we can't settle for less than grace. We can't settle. The word grace here, by the way, is charis. It just means favor, power, blessing. It's what God gives when we receive Jesus. And this is what Paul taught the church, as a matter of fact. I need you to catch this. Because Paul talked about grace this way. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10. He said, whatever I... Now remember, this was the same Paul known as Saul, who before he met Jesus was a religious bigot. He was the old version of ISIS. Come on, somebody. Like, no joke. 1 Corinthians 15.10. But whatever I am now, he says... It is all because God poured out His special favor on me. That word there is grace, charis. It's the same word. When Barnabas said, I saw the charis of God, the power, the blessing, the favor of God on these people. Now, but listen, he doesn't stop there. He said, because God poured out His special charis on me and not without results. When the favor of God hits your life, it will always produce something. Religion produces nothing, but grace produces everything you need to live for God. Well, how do I change? Well, how do I do this? Well, what does it look like? What do I need to do? First and foremost, just get under the flow of Jesus. Just get under the grace of God. Just plug into a healthy church where the Spirit of God is moving. Just run in the grace of God. Your life will not look the same in 12 months, I promise you. But listen to what he said. For I've worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by His grace. So this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, it was grace that changed me. And it's also grace that changes others through me. So what is he trying to say? He's saying that there is an outworking of grace that happens in the life of every believer. We receive grace. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. There is a working of grace in our life that changes us. But then God works through you by that same grace to impact the world. Say, I am revival. If you have received grace, you are to distribute grace to the world around you. If your life has changed, there is something in you that can change the world. The same power that changed you is present in your life to change the world around you. Never let the devil convince you that you don't have something to offer the world. If you have a testimony of Jesus changing your life, then the power of the Holy Spirit is present in your life to change the world around you. He said, as I worked, the grace of God worked through me. It changed me. It changed the world through me. I am revival. I want you to write this down. It's my last thought and I'll get you out of here. This is what revival does. It turns the church not only toward grace, but it turns the, turns the church toward the world. I'm going to read to you. Um, we're going to skip down to Acts 11, verse 27. And the Bible says, During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. 
One of them was named Agabus, who was probably one of the most prominent prophets in the New Testament church, by the way. And Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea. They were a multi-campus church, by the way. So they shared their resources all around so that everybody had everything they needed. Everyone giving as much as they could. They did this in trusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. So here's some thoughts I want you to get because revival, it'll turn our hearts toward grace in the church. But revival should turn our hearts then toward the world. And here's what I want you to write down. First of all, revival will always lead into generosity. It will always lead into generosity. As God was moving, generosity was flowing. They said, whatever you need, we, we, we'll cover it. Whatever you lack, we'll make sure that there's enough. Here's what I've learned about revival. And I learned this when God first started moving supernaturally in kind of one of the first moves we saw when we began filling up our original auditorium and we went to three services and we ran out of room. It was before we built this building. And I remember Pastor Monty and Kelly led because eternity matters. And it was a campaign where we all gave money, basically. We were like, hey, we got to build a building. We got to have more space. And I remember Amanda and I, we, had, we were on fire for God. I mean, man, we had just come out of this thing. and Our lives, we had believed and turned. Come on, somebody. We, we did a 180 and started living for God. And I remember we did these offerings where we would bring buckets into the altars. You guys remember these off? Y'all don't know nothing about those offerings. And we just give everything we had, like whatever, whatever it took. And I remember one time, I, 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 the Lord spoke to me. And at the time, $350 was like, was so much money. We were so broke. The only thing new we had in our house was our TV. We had a couch that was so old. If you sat in the middle, you needed a tetanus shot. Okay? Like, it was, we were so broke. And we're, I mean, sacrificially, we're giving like month after month, month after month, month after month, month after month. And I remember we did this special offering because we're like, we need more money. We've got to move the needle. We've got to build this building. And, and, and I remember, I don't have any, I don't have anything left. And I'll never forget in that service, I was so moved to just be a part of what God was doing. I didn't have any more money to give, but Amanda had just bought me this chain. She's still bitter about this today, by the way. She had just bought me this silver chain and this watch. And I remember I took my chain off and I took my watch off and I brought it up to the altar and I put it in the bucket because nothing was too great. No sacrifice was too much for the move of God. And I was thinking about that this week and I just thought, Lord, I never want to lose that heart where stuff and materialism would be more important than souls and what Jesus is building. And one of the great indicators of a real move of God is that people respond in radical generosity. Whatever is needed to plant the next church, whatever is needed to bring on the next pastor, whatever is needed to buy the equipment to reach the world, whatever's needed to do this or do that or send missionaries or fund this organization, whatever we need, it's fine. We'll give it because the mission is more important than the material. Revival wakes you up to what really matters. And it's not the things of this world. It's eternity. We don't take anything with us to heaven but people. Everything else burns. And I'm not saying don't have a retirement account and don't leave something to you. I'm not saying that. The Bible says that the godly leave an inheritance to their children's children. But the godly also realize that we don't take nothing with us to heaven but people. And you know, I'm so glad to be a part of a church that is extraordinarily generous. Do you know that just this year, the Giving in Christian Faith Center is up 30% year over year? Can we just pause and thank God? Not 3%, 30%. Third, this is a generous church. And that, that's not say that is indicative that we are in a move of God. This church has been in a move of God for 15 years. And God's still moving. 
Get ready. We're going to plant more churches. We're going to send more leaders. We're going to do more. Th- Why? Because eternity still matters. Revival always brings radical generosity. This is my final thought. I'm going to get you guys out of here. It's my last thing. My final, my third close. Revival will lead us. Listen, not only does it lead us into generosity, it leads us into a love for the world. If it's revival, it will awaken you to God's nature. That's why generosity happens, because God's so loved that he gave. God is a giving God. It's in his nature to be generous, but it's in his nature to love. The Bible says these three things will last forever, forever, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Because God is not faith and God is not hope, but God is love. Love is a direct representation of God's character and nature. Real revival will cause you to look like God. It will cause you to emulate the nature of... Let me say it this way. If anything in your life causes you to hate people, it's not God. If your, if your politics causes you to hate people, you're doing it wrong. If religion causes you to hate people, you're doing it so wrong. If your friends cause you to hate a group of people, you're doing it wrong. Because revival will wake you up until you'll lay down your life for people that don't even like you. We will love this world. A church on fire for God will love the world. Will love the world. Not hate the world, not point fingers at the world. Will invite the world in into the grace of God. This is why we can never become just a clean church where everybody's all good, nobody's got any problems, we all fake it so well because the world needs to see that we are saved by the grace of God too. That we need the same blood of Jesus to wash our lives. That we're dependent on the same grace of God. That there's hope for your struggle. That there's hope for your soul. That there's hope for your family. That there is grace for your mistakes. Grace for your family. Grace for your addiction. Grace for your darkness. Grace for your bondage. Grace for your depression. That Jesus is alive and working in His church. And the church doesn't hate you. The church loves you. If you're busted, we love you. If you're broke, we love you. If you're disconnected from God, we love you. Because God loved us first. Listen, it begins with us. It begins with turning to Jesus. It begins with deciding that you don't just want revival, but you're going to be it. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I need to pray for you guys, get you out of here. If our prayer teams could come to the front. Online family. I'd invite you into this moment. If you just say, I, I want to be a part of what, I want God to use me in a powerful way. Why don't you just type into the chat, just say, I am revival. I am revival. I don't just want it. I don't just hope for it. I'm going to be it. I, I am it. I am revival. I am the move of God. Maybe you're here today and you just say, pastor, I, I don't, I don't want to just do church. I don't want to just do my, I, I don't want to just do Christianity and religion. I, I want to live for Jesus. I want to make a difference in the world. I don't want to just hope that God will move. I want to let God move through me. First of all, it begins with surrendering your life to Jesus. And if you're here today, every head bowed and every eye closed. If you just say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with Jesus, but I want to turn today. I want to believe in Jesus. I want to turn to him and live for God. I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand so I can see it. I'm going to pray for you. If you say, I want to believe in Jesus, I want to turn to him. One, two, three. Raise your hand so I can see him. Raise them high. High, 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 high. Not to be ashamed. I see you and you and you and you and you and you and you. Just tell Jesus, just say, I believe. And I turn to you, Jesus. I give you my whole life. I'm sorry. I repent for my failure and my sin. I turn to you, Jesus. I turn away from my old life and I turn wholeheartedly to you. Save me, God. Forgive me, God. Make me clean, God. Give me a new life, a new heart, a new start. I turn to you with all that I am and I will live for you. Just tell him. Just pour your heart out to him. Salvation is coming to your life right now. Online, if that's you and you need to turn to Jesus, just type, I'm turning, I'm turning, I'm turning. And somebody's going to connect with you and pray with you online. Salvation is coming to families, to lives right now in Jesus' name. And if you're here today, 
Maybe you'd say, Pastor, I love Jesus. I really do, but I need God to wake me up. I'm in a fog. I'm in a 4 a.m. Christianity right now. I'm getting swayed and convinced by every news article and news station. My passion for God is dead and dying. I'm not where I need to be with Jesus. Maybe I'm here and you say, Pastor, you ticked me off today, but I needed it. I need to wake up. I, I need to... I need to stop calling bad things good and good things bad. I need to turn to God with all. I I need God to use me in a powerful way. I need revival to start in me and move through me. If that's you today and you'd be so bold as to say, Pastor, I, I want to not just hope for revival. I want to be revival. As we start this series, I'm ready. I'm ready for revival and I want it to start with me. I want you to do this on the count of three. I want you to stand up on your feet and I'm going to pray for you that the power of God would fall on your life fresh. One, two, three, all across the room. Just stand up, stand up. If you say, I I want revival to start with me. I want it to start with me. I'm gonna pray for you. And as I'm praying, if you need someone else to pray for you, you can walk right down to the altar. We're gonna lay hands on you. We're gonna pray for God to fill you with his spirit. We're gonna pray for God to stir up your faith. We're gonna pray for God to move fresh in your home, in your family, in your heart, and in your life. You can stay in your seat if you want, but if you want, you can come forward right now. We're just gonna pray for you. And I'm gonna believe that you're gonna leave here with a fresh power, a fresh unction, a fresh passion to live for Jesus, that you will become revival in your home, in your workplace, and where you are our Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now, all across this room, everyone watching online, for the favor of God to fall upon our lives like the hand of God that moved on Antioch. Move on us. Move on us, oh God. Light us on fire today. I pray every passive Christian would catch on fire. I pray every timid Christian would receive boldness. I pray every person whose faith has gone dry would the river of God would flow upon their lives right now. God, stir us up. May revival begin in our hearts, but not stop there. May it flow to every corner of our community, every city and our state, every person that needs it. God, May the grace we've received flow through us. We pray for it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.